So welcome back to the next episode of Mr. Whiskey or Whiskey Talks. And today we're at a medium craft, small guy uh, distillery, Overeem in just out of Hobart. Whereabouts are we? We're in, in Huntingfield. Huntingfield, okay. And um, I'll let you both introduce yourself and let you, let you tell people what you actually do at the actual, at the actual distillery. Sure. Uh, my name's Mark Sawford. I'm the uh, um, one of the owners here with Jane, and uh, I suppose I'm the head of production here and uh, help Jane with with a bit of sales as well. Um, Jane. Yeah, and I'm Jane Sawford, formerly Jane Overeem, um, and I am probably more hands-on in the sales and marketing aspects of the business. Right. But the whole Overeem is your family side, isn't baby, it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. where did that start? How long ago did the whole baby start and where did it actually start? Yeah, so my father, Casey Overeem, founded Overeem Distillery in 2007. Um, he got his distiller's license in 2005, um, but actually started production in 2007. We released our first Overeem single malt whiskies uh, in 2012 after five years maturation. Yeah. And they were, you showed me a photo before, which we'll get out and we'll, we'll show people on the camera a little bit later on. Where was that actually located and what kind of, what kind of factors? We're in a pretty good setup here. How was it set up back then? Yeah, it's increased in size substantially. <laughs> um, it was originally set up in, in Casey's front yard yep. uh, in a very small purpose built shed, just that, uh, a shed that fit just around uh, the stills actually. So it was very small uh, with one little desk in there, not a lot of room to move. Um, and yeah, it was it was really set up as Casey's retirement hobby, um, which in the end ended up being quite uh, quite more serious and, yeah. and bigger operation than than hobby business. Mm. So did it become a family event then, or was it kind of it was just that there was just the one person running? What, yeah, how many look, people were involved back then? Uh, I learned to distill in the early years, yeah. um, but during the the main the first five years of, of production, it was mainly just uh, my father Casey. Um, Mum was there as a very supportive sounding board, <laughs> sounding board and she still is. Um, but it was really just Dad and he had one other distiller, Wim, his good friend. Um, and actually my brother-in-law, Nick, did a bit yeah, of distilling did, for a little yeah. while. So yeah, family operation, but mainly mainly Dad distilling. Did your mum think your dad was a little bit crazy getting into it? Look, she is always so supportive. She just <laughs> lets him do what he wants. You know, he buys motorbikes and, yep, that's all good. Very he nice starts a distillery. That's sure. all good. Yeah, so they're all good. It's got to be a level where your mum just kind of goes, no, nah, done. You've done everything now. Yeah. and go from there. <laughs> so what's your background in whiskey then? Because you, you know, did you grow up with it? Is it uh, something you were drinking in the park? And, no, you not know? so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think we all drink yeah, whiskey yeah, that's in the park a, at some stage. Yeah. But, I've got um, a video about me about when I first started drinking whiskey. When I was 16. Oh. I was drinking Johnny Walker cans in the park. So. Yeah. So that's yeah. my introduction yeah. to whiskey. All been there and done something like that. <laughs> uh, look, my, my background is hospitality. So okay. um, uh, venue management, business management. So I sort of um, owned a few venues for about oh, maybe 12, 12, 15 years now. Yeah. So, um, so I've always sort of been in hospitality. Mm. Um, I think I met Jane uh, not long after they launched Overeem. So uh, um, my, my knowledge of whiskey prior to meeting Jane was, was, was probably pretty... Uh, a uh, pretty, it wasn't overly uh, uh, overly deep, yep. um, I, I, especially Tasmanian whiskey. I tried a few Tasmanian whiskies. I, I sort of uh, I knew Bill. Uh, Bill was a bit of a regular down at um, down down at, down at the restaurant that we were running, and um, uh, and then I suppose Joan and I dreamt of, um, of of starting our own distillery one day after after the sale of Overeem went through. Yeah. Um, and so the transition from, from hospitality management and, and being in the hospitality industry, um, which is because it's because of the nature of the industry being so low margin, it, it's very, it relies heavily on, on, on being systematic and process driven. And so that transition from there to, to, to operating a distillery and running a distillery was um, it, 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 it related very well with me and my background. Um, you know, watching you before, we've been here for a couple of hours or a couple of, an hour and a half or so, and watching you go through it and, and learning a bit about it, you are very systemized because yeah. you do everything yourself now. You don't, not, you're not relying 100% on technology, which some of these big distilleries are now. And sure. no offense, you probably can't afford the massive things yeah. that they do as well. But yeah. you know, that technology is obviously advancing. But a lot of the times when people are using that and the feedback you get is the fact that they're actually the taste comes away. They're not producing the whiskey that they used to produce and a lot of those fans are actually moving to other distills. So you guys are doing everything pretty much by hand, taste and feel and smell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a, it's a big part of 
the foundation of what Overeem was was established on. That's yeah. where when Casey decided to start his distillery back in 2007, as Jay mentioned, it was very much. It wasn't a, it wasn't financially driven. It was it was purely Casey trying to make the best possible single malt whiskey he could. That he could, could. Yeah. It's an that expensive was, hobby. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> when you reach semi-retirement, I suppose we, we spoke about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. So that you, you want something to keep you uh, to keep you uh, occupied. occupied. Yeah. Uh, but like you say, it wasn't an expensive hobby. But he wanted he wanted to create a whiskey that you know would stand alongside or could be enjoyed alongside the best whiskeys in the world. So yeah. all the processes and all the systems and all the techniques and recipes that he, that, that, that he established and developed um, always had that in mind. So. Yeah. Uh, a big part of what we do here is following those processes. Yeah. yeah? So, like, uh, we're not we're not overly innovative in what we do. Um, we're, we're, I suppose we're follow we're, a method. Follow follow the method. Um, but as you mentioned, it's it's still very hands on, very craft. We everything sensory evaluated. Um, things do change day to day. But um, those that the backbone of what we do here is is really founded on what Casey found at the distillery. So the method is very similar to what your dad started. Is that yeah, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah. but now you've taken over. You kind of tweaked it to do yours, or do you? You're pretty much fundamentally keeping the same kind of system. Yeah. No. We're we're keeping the same system. Um, yep. We like to think we've improved some of the techniques, but again. All approved by by Casey. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> he has said, if I had my time again, I would have done this or I would have done that differently. And so we've said, well, let's do those things yeah. differently. Um, but no, very much still following the same um, same the processes. Yeah. Mm. So everyone has like a whiskey journey that's very different in like getting into it and how they start exploring whiskeys and so on. Obviously, you know, um, you weren't five years of age when your dad was doing it. Yeah. You know? it was, so. Um, was thirteen? Years, was it thirteen years ago? Eight. How old was I when I started? I think the story where you. Was right, we don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to dig out your age. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, but for, for you, what was the process of learning, um, like how to smell a nose of whiskey and then experience the taste on the palate and all that kind of stuff? Because it's probably very different to yours. Absolutely. For sure. yeah. you know, so I'd love to know what your journey of that kind of thing was and and the yeah. experiences that you had. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've told this story a number of times, so apologies if you've heard it before, but um, when I was 18, I actually went to my first malt whiskey convention um, and Dad said this is, he, he taught me what uh, he wanted me to, to know, but he said it's also really great for you to go and learn um, from other people, obviously, um, and we sat down at a conference at 10 a.m. in the morning with six whiskies to try, and that was where I learned about nose. Um, mm on the palate and then finish and all of that sort of thing and a lot of the chemistry behind how to make whiskey and, and how to taste it. So that was great but um, yeah, it was a lot for me to take in at 18, six whiskies and at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. <laughs> and, and I didn't actually realise that you, were, you could spit them so I was drinking them all properly and I was like how do people keep up with this you know but anyway I learned so much that that particular day um, and I've still got my old notes from that convention and wow. um, yeah, it was an awesome experience and the minute I started to learn how to enjoy whiskey I really started to enjoy whiskey yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah just just tasting whiskey prior to that I wasn't I thought oh I don't know if I'm gonna love this yeah. but when you actually start to learn and appreciate um, different things about it that mm. was yeah, that was really important for me. Do you, or oh, we'll go to you, what was your experience mm. on getting into whiskey? Obviously, you come from a hospitality trade, so there would have been whiskey behind counters sure, absolutely. and stuff like that. Absolutely. But I'm assuming most people went, oh, I'll have a whiskey and coke. Yeah, look, yeah. Especially, yeah. Yeah. especially in that era, I think that, you know, we didn't have a lot of customers, you know, drinking drinking whiskey neat. Yeah. Uh, um, especially because the Australian industry was, um, was, was, was almost non-existent back then. Um, but I suppose I sort of relate to Jane's uh, experience with regards to, once you are, once you learn how to appreciate whiskey, it's just a, it's an entirely new ball game, you know. Yeah. And so I suppose for that, really, that happened to me back maybe only ten years ago, sort of like not long after. Twelve, I, I reckon. Yeah, when when I, when I met you, I remember. Yeah, so you're the bad really influence. The bad influence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd, I'd actually start arguing that's a good influence because maybe I was drinking whiskey in parks back before then, I know, but, <laughs> sure. but like, um, uh, yeah, so I, I remember, I mean, I think whiskey's got a lot to do with story and nostalgia, and I, and I clearly remember when we sat down with a, with a, with a few of my friends that, that, uh, that afternoon, and, um, and, and Jane walked us through an overeem, and, yeah. and, and really walked us through it, and I don't think I'd ever really sat on a whiskey for that long before, I think, I, you know, like, it, was, it was a decent pour, as Jane generally does, in some <laughs> case, um, uh, and, and we sat on it for for 
maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, and just really explored it, and I really got to understand um, yeah, how to appreciate a whiskey. Right, okay. Yeah. So for someone that's kind of starting out and um, you know getting into it, you've got a whole different variance of cast strengths and obviously, obviously lower ABVs as well. Yeah. But if someone wants to learn about all of that, what would be a place or a suggestion that you would kind of give a newbie? Because most of the people that watch this, uh, some of them met me a couple of years ago where I would just drink whiskey and Cokes mm. and, you know, and I would drink this straight as well most sure. of the time but I wasn't into appreciating it. I was just drinking it because it would get me drunk kind of yeah. thing. And it's been the last couple of years that I've actually started to appreciate it, like what you've gone through yourself. Mm -hmm. Where would you start them? Or what would a bit of advice that you would give them to be like, okay, cool, this is where I would start and this is how I would do things? Look, I would start at a lower strength alcohol to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we an entry level um, whiskey at around 40 plus, you know, mm -hmm. 40, anywhere between 40 and 46% I would recommend. Um, and then I guess a few few tips that I would recommend is to, um, this is actually how Dad taught me. He said to, to pour a nice big whiskey and let it open up in your glass, you know, swirl it around and let it air, you know, air, aerate a little bit um, and then have a really good look at the whiskey and then just nose it for a while mm. and really start to just think about what you nose. What, what can yeah. you smell? Not not what the tasting notes yeah. or the nosing notes yeah. say. What can you smell? Because everyone's different. Um, and then he always said, take your first sip and roll it around your molars and really let your whole mouth just yeah. be filled with Open the whiskey. Up your Open up yeah. your palate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it it's up. your second yeah. sip that you really start to go, okay, how does it feel around my palate? How, do, how does it feel going down? And what's the finish after that? But um, And then trying it with some drops of water. Yeah. Mm. Open the whiskey up. Um, when we drop a couple of drops of water in over him, we always um, find that we get these beautiful floral notes that we don't get unless we add yes. those couple of drops of water. So just little things like that and just taking your time to really in, um, to, to really enjoy it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Just sit down and actually appreciate yeah. it. So, yeah. so obviously with the water, that opens it up because obviously the oils change and, and everything like that. So that opens up. And there's so many whiskies that we've done, I've done reviews on, and you don't appreciate a cast strength. And then you put a couple of drops in and it just opens and you up can. and you go, like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's quite absolutely. interesting. Yeah. And so we'll talk about a little bit behind here. You've got obviously samples of what you've done and we've been drinking some cast strength today. Mm. Um, what do you normally, what's your normal kind of release that you put out there and what's your favorite? Because obviously everyone's different. So what's your favorite and, and uh, for your strength and what's your favorite? Mm. So our core range is ex-port cask, ex-sherry cask, and soon to be ex-bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, we have released some ex-bourbon in the past from Overeem, but we've got a lot of it coming on mid-2022. Um, we're releasing at 43% and cask strength 60. Uh, my go-to is definitely a port cask at 43%. For me, it's just our flagship whiskey. It's always approachable, easy drinking, um, and I def definitely recommend that to um, people who are new to whiskey. Mm. Right, okay. Mm. And yourself, what do you enjoy? Oh, look, I'll probably, I'll, I'll probably <laughs> sit on the fence a little bit here because yeah. I think, um, although I mean, being a single cast, predominantly a single cast distillery, uh, um, we see we do see subtle variances between casks, um, yep. although it, mm. it fundamentally holds the overim signature. Um, it, it, we do see variances, so you know it, it, it may change from month to month, or, or sometimes from week to week, depending on how many casks we're decanting. But uh, um, sometimes I'm really drawn to a particular, you know, port cask or cask strength. It's just we, we we taste it straight out of the barrel, and we're like, wow, that is going to be a ripping whiskey, yeah. and uh, and. And I might take a bottle of that home to sit on my shelf for, yeah, yeah. you know, for, for a few weeks and work my way through that. Whereas yeah. in uh, um, other times, like Jane said, it might be a port cask at 43 or it might be a sherry. If the sherry's drinking particularly well, it does. It really does vary. And um, I mean, I'd say that the sherry's drinking, the last couple of sherries that we've um, sherry barrels that we've decanted, they're drinking beautifully at the moment. We're yeah. loving them. So um, it, it does it does vary. It's almost like whiskey being your favourite song that just changes yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the time. and it depends yeah. on your mood as well yeah. I was, I was yeah. just about to say this because yeah. whiskey is such one of those things that you can enjoy it in so many different ways yeah. different times but the temperature 
if it's cold outside, you're probably sure. going to want something else. Yeah. Your calf strength, probably warm yourself up a little bit better and things yeah. like that. If it's a summer whiskey, you know, we were talking about that before, you probably want something a little bit lighter, Absolutely. a little yeah. bit less, you know, punchy kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it also, what's the social, like if you're going to a party, sure. yeah. who are you going with? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I know I've got to bring calf strength when I'm going to a few yeah. mates. Yeah. And I know I'm going to bring some 46% so I'm going to certain other mates as well. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But yeah, every day your palate changes and, and I, I'm very open to try all different things mm. i'm normally sitting around that 46 percent yeah unless it's like a single barrel where i've just got to go no it's got to be cast strength because then i want to be able to play around with it myself and, yeah. and have those little bit of waters through that yeah so going away from the brand yes and you don't have to say it if you don't want to if you don't want to talk about competition but um what's your favorite whiskey currently you're drinking well Talk about you, so Ooh, something that's, that's a home really tricky question. That you, that you go to, yeah, local or um, it doesn't or, have to be. No, 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 no it doesn't have to be. What are we yeah. loving at home at the moment? Can be anything. Um, well, we just finished that that old Pulteney, which we really enjoyed. Um, I'm a big fan of the Ever Yeah, the, that's one of our favourites, actually. Right, okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's is that how one you pronounce it? Whiskey. It was a tricky one. But Thank that, God I'm not the only person that gets the pronunciation yeah. wrong. But that one at Car Strength I love. Yeah, so you right, know how right, I was saying earlier magic. my go-to yes. would be a, a 43%. That particular cask I love at yep. 60%. Mm -hmm. um, so do you play around with it then on the, on the water level or you just leave it? I did that one. Well, I tried it. But I was like, nope, happy straight out of the bottle with that one. And that's rare for me. There you go. Yeah. So do you both generally have the same kind of appreciation for the same bottle or do you kind I of go... I we are pretty similar. Yeah. Because there's one, there's a fair few at home that we've tried. We've tipped them back in the bottle and said, right. no, we're not going to... Because look, lately I've been trying to only drink alcohol on the weekends. Yep. So if I'm going to sit there and have a really nice whiskey, it's got to be nice. Otherwise I'm putting it back in the bottle and oh, I'm yeah. going to go for something else. There you go. Mm. Mm. So what kind and we of... we tend to do the, the same. Yeah. I think we choose yeah. the same You've one. got a pretty good collection in the back corner over here as yep. well. Some bottles that I wouldn't mind stealing. <laughs> um, what's the collection like at home? Probably uh, probably a little bit more modern. That's a... That's a, that's that's a, a pretty old that's collection. That's a pretty old right, collection. Right, okay. Um, yeah. That's probably more there because they're all empty. It's more yeah. like Oh, okay. So there's no point me stealing a bottle then? You can yeah. steal the boxes. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. It's more of, from a branding inspiration perspective. Yeah, right, okay. I'm trying to get some ideas. And, 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 uh, but the, the, the collection at home is definitely a lot more modern. Yeah, and, we're uh, trying to try a lot of the yeah. new ones that are coming mm, okay. out. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a really good question. You said that's your inspiration. So where do you get your inspiration from? Obviously, you try and stick with... Um, the old system you were doing. Sure. Can we talk about the rule of the how many years on the yeah, barrels? Yeah, Okay, cool. Yeah, so you, yeah. you. So what surprised me about our in, uh, our walk around today was that you don't release anything unless it's five years of age or older. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's something that in Australian whiskey is kind of not heard of in yeah. the sense of like, no, this has to be it. Now there's going to be people watching this going, no, I release mine at five sure. years as well, but it's not common, is it? No. It's kind of like. Two and a half years or three years or whatever it is, as soon as I can release it because it says it's whiskey after two years, it's out the door kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you have five years. So where did that come from? And what was the inspiration that you're getting for other future whiskey barrels? Yeah, sure. So this is um, trialed and tested over the years. You mm. know, we've been um, releasing whiskey for 10 years now. So we had plenty of years where we tried barrels at four and a half. Yep. Um, they were fantastic. But we said, let's wait till five plus and see if they just get even better. Um, and what we found over those years is that anything over five years, it was getting better. Yeah. So even though it was a cracker at four and a half, it was an even it's better, better bigger cracker at, four, for, at five plus. So we just said general rule is five years. Um, and even if we tried at five years and think mm, it's not quite hitting that nine out of ten, nine and a half out of ten score that we go for around our internal tasting panel, we leave it for at least another three to six months until yeah. it does hit that mark. So. We're never releasing whiskey because we need it. Yeah. We're always releasing whiskey because yeah. we believe it's 100% ready. And on the, on the flip side of that is like when we've, we've sampled casts that go from, only a few casts will make it to six to seven years. Yeah. yeah. So like we have released, there was a few releases that we did last year that were six to six and a half, mm. um, but that's probably the, minor, the minority. Yeah, yeah right, like okay. Yeah. It'll last that long without getting over and too drying. And, and, I'm, and I'm that's sure the biggest concern yeah. about this Australian whiskey stuff is because our climate is so much different and things mm. like that. Not all Tasmania is more like Scotland anyway, but yeah. The Australian whiskey, if it goes over that six or seven years, you generally get so much of that oak coming yeah, through it's in time. Like it's just yeah. not great. Yeah, we, we, so, I, I probably wouldn't like to use no, it yeah. as a bit of a blanket terminology because we, that. 
the, the, this this principle and and, and that we stick by is is really relevant to what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, yeah, yeah. and, and that's was... that's because of the variances, you know, from 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 a recipe to distillation techniques yep. to to, to cast to bond store and maturation mm. environment. So all of those things impact the final, you know, the the the, the, the final product and and uh, and that. Uh, they're the reasons why we make we, we've made that statement. Yeah, that, you know, five to six years is really that sweet spot. Yeah, for okay. Our, for for our yeah, and, yeah. Works, and that works for you guys. Yes, yes. Yes. It works for everyone. It, everyone's obviously different because the new make is going to be a different recipe. And, yes. Yeah. You know how they. You know, even the barrels where they get them from is going to yeah. be different. climate, humidity, yeah. like as in everything. There's so many variances that um, this that this works well for us. In it, yeah, with, with, with our variances. Yeah. So looking back over there again, we're talking about your inspiration. What is your inspiration? What's something that you kind of look at and go, that's us, like, or, or the future of what we would like to be? Yeah. That's a hard it is question. A good question. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. For me, it's it's age and yep. yeah, long-term maturation. Right. That's what we're striving towards now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're still a young distillery yep. in the grand scheme of things. Yep. and. We're really excited about releasing um, our 12 year old. I this was going to ask if we were allowed to talk about that. That's probably a nice segue into is that, that. Is that yeah. exclusive? No, oh, oh. Uh, no, oh maybe. Not. I don't know if we've really oh, talked about that. I was hoping that was an exclusive. There we go. Not quite sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're looking at really long long term um, maturation. So yeah. I love all the, all the boxes we've got up there with age statements of 12 plus. Um, and look, yeah, we're releasing a lot of. 200 and 300 litre casks over the coming five to 10 years mm -hmm. and that we're really excited about. Um, did you ever do 20 litre casks? We like actually it, we actually did do we trial, a trial. 50. trial. We, we tried 50 to 20 yeah. litre casks and um, it just was not they were too inconsistent. What we wanted. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, we, we, we moved them on. And that's why um, they're able, like a lot of these new guys coming into the market, they're able to release them in two years time because yeah. obviously it's 20 litre cast. Yeah. So yeah. your average cast size, what are we working with here? 100, 100 litre quarter cast. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100, 100 plus is probably, yeah, between 100 and 125. Yep. And, um, but as Jane mentioned, we're moving into, as the distillery ages, we're yep. moving into larger, larger, larger cast maturations yep. and trying to balance that out. I think the, that, that, that quarter cask or the 100 litre cask, five to six year old maturation, I think that will always be part of our core range. Um, yeah. But we're definitely excited about uh, uh, about releasing um, casks on uh, larger casks with, 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 with greater ages. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, talking about casks then, if you could get any cask in the world, what would something you'd love to experiment with? And I'll give you an idea of what, yeah. what, what some people have said yeah. tequila cask. Ah, that's, so, that's just, not something that comes to mind. No, you know, no well, John, for John, me, for but me, John, like, John yeah, from Hobart <laughs> Whiskey is a crazy weird guy, and we <laughs> love him to bits yeah. because of it. And he just wants to get the tequila cast to try. Hey, but, a know, good quality tequila cast. It might work. Yeah, you know, there's obviously things like tequila, ginger beer yeah. casts that have gone out there. You yeah. know, Old Hempton's just releasing one through their whiskey club at the moment. Obviously, Star Wars does that every year for their big yeah. releases. Is there a cast that you would love to get, or even like even if it was a port cast, but from some kind of you know some other kind of winemakers around yeah. the world what what would be the number one you would get gosh i would love to get a cask from a, a distillery that i love mm. you know that's released one of our best whiskies i'd love to fin uh, like right yep finish it off an over in, in another distillery's amazing cask yep mm. and they've had real success we can just see how it goes how it even goes. if it even if it is a second fill we don't second fill here but that'd be something fun to sure i'm with it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for us it's just about it's, it's it's more about sourcing the best possible what we can. Yeah. yeah. So like uh, because we're we're big on consistency and that's what we and, and that's what we try to achieve. Yeah. So um uh, but if we're talking about like a fun sort of almost new world let's, project let's call or something, a, a, a private cast, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah, I think um, I'd really like to do a rum finish. I mean, it doesn't sound too um, yeah. uh, too too out there and too innovative, but it is, yeah, it is like something rum, different so from, yeah. from, from, from an overhand. I'd like to yeah. see how our spirit and our whiskey reacts, um, with, reacts with a rum cast, whether it be a full maturation or a finish. So, so um, talk, mate, and I don't do rum at all. I've got a few mates of mine that do. What mm -hmm. rum would it be? Do you um, have a certain rum that you kind of go to? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. I no? think, uh, no, I, I'd have that. to do some research on that. And, yeah. um, and, and, I, and I'd have to, so would you go more spiced rum, or you like your normal like? No, I'd thing? go. I'd, I'd go. I'd, spiced yeah. rum, you love us. I'd definitely go spiced. Yeah, rum. right. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like so, do you know that um, John's done a Lafrog 
cask. Oh, mm. nice. So either that. I don't know if I was supposed to say that one, no, but you, can. Uh, no, no, you, uh, you, I'm, I'm you know what? Okay, cool. There we go. Cool. I'm like, you went no, and I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah. No, um, no, I think the bar it. guy we were at last night spoke about it. So, yeah, but, sure. um, yeah he made sure like just finished it off in the cask. So it was like ten only, days or something. Wasn't yeah, it was nothing. He finished it in there. Yeah, because yeah, he put it in for a lot. It just it just the smokiness came yeah. out of it. It was yeah. just crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I think because it's really nice to know that yes, you do this thing because this is what you do and you do it best. But there's always something I find with most people I'm talking to that there's something in the back of their head they want to try they want to experiment with and go from there yeah sure so what um we spoke about how whiskey kind of brings people together and it's like really good experiences and stuff like that what's one of the best whiskey experiences you've ever had wow um big question Mm. trying to nail it down to or so a good memory or something like that that you you know it could have been together or you know yeah. you, you you've laid a cast for the kids and things like that as yeah. well or yeah we have done that. A, good yeah, night, cool. a good night out maybe yeah, yeah that's know. cool like, what, i'll probably i'll probably refer yeah, to, jim to a couple oh tasting. yeah that was cool that was actually cool. that was a great tasting yeah when jim mckeown <laughs> did his australian race show back in like it must have been early 2013 or 2012 or something and um he did it at a, at a hotel down here in hobart and uh that was a pretty cool experience for anyone who went on those road shows i remember uh, it was like the fifth or sixth whiskey of the night. Um, I think it might have been the last whiskey of the night. He said it was the Octoball. And uh, he said, right, he goes, can everyone please stand while we um, sing the Scottish National Anthem? And we thought, oh, this is all pretty serious. Well, all, it's all sort of like we're getting, getting a bit lively at this time. And he goes, um, stand on your chairs to sing it, please. So we yeah, stood on the chairs. Yeah, and everyone was... And we're all like, oh, we're a little bit... <laughs> yeah, we're like, yeah. maybe. And, uh, and then I would walk 500 miles by the Proclaimers come on. And yeah. everyone oh, yeah. right. sing it. And, yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was a really cool way to finish the tasting. And that, that sticks out of my mind. But uh, yeah. obviously filling the cask on the, on the day that uh, our youngest son was born. Was and a, even just filling our first cask together was awesome. Filling our first cask. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then Decanting. just little things like just sitting around the fire with Casey and Jane and a few mates like down at our shack and uh, and sitting, enjoying a whiskey or two. I mean, they're the they're the real fun times, I reckon. I'm we assuming you've acquired a few more extra mates since you've taken. Yeah, genuine. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, so what, for yourself, what would be uh, like the big highlight of the whole whiskey yeah, thing for you? Decanting Dad's first cast. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah after cool. waiting five years um, and see his dream just become a reality yeah and I just I've got the video of it and I just love it I'll oh keep wow it forever. and he it was just sitting underneath it like just massive green and he just said to me do you reckon we're going to be able to sell it like yeah. <laughs> and I just think yeah that was just so special yeah. and you know you invest all that time and money and yeah. um and then yeah you decant your first cask and obviously he'd sampled them along the way so he had a good idea of how it's coming along but actually going this needs to go into bottle next week mm. and we've got to do something with it you know, yeah. that was pretty special. Yeah. So one of the things that, obviously, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, I come from a family business as well, where, you know, Dad was a, was a business owner. Mm. And the one thing I kind of regret is not taking over kind of the business that he left behind and I'm now working off somewhere and, and basically, you know, working for somebody else doing yeah. the exact same trade. Mm. It's a little bit emotional in a, in a sense because I know for a fact that he kind of, he wanted to set that up for me to continue at the end of the day. and. That's probably not where it started for your dad, but it obviously that's where it probably grew into. Mm-hmm. And obviously it was sold to the business and, and um, you've now bought that back. Yeah. What was that like? Like, I, I, like that would have to be an emotional kind of experience to be like, okay, this is back. This is what we started as our name. This is yeah. back in our family again. What was it like? It was, it almost felt like a, a full- A full circle. A full circle because- um, in the right timing, don't yeah, you? Yeah, because Jane and I, I think we were married or we were engaged when Casey was selling and mm. um, and we spoke about like imagine if we could come up with the finances to be able to um, uh, and we looked at it and and Casey I think even at the time said no I don't want to sell it to you guys because you know it's just the wrong time for yeah. you and yeah. and, uh, and and we sort of thought and looking back in hindsight now it absolutely was yeah, I mean, yeah. That, this was pre-children with us and uh, and, and and so and then when 2016, 2017 came along, when we when we finally um, uh, got our got our manufacturer's license and got our steels manufactured and then started production, mm. um, you know, for 12 months later, for that opportunity to be presented to us again, 
um, it just felt it felt right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like as in it was uh, it, it felt like perfect timing for that for that to come back around. Mm. And and that was a pretty special time as well when we after we'd had the meeting and we we, we were asked whether or not we'd like to purchase the Overeem brand back. Um, to mention that to Casey and to see oh. his eyes light up, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, and to see what that meant to him, yeah, he was like, oh, you'd be mad if you didn't. Yeah. 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 I rang yeah. Dad and I said, oh, cool. can you come down this afternoon? There's a couple yeah. of things I want to um, <laughs> mention to you, and um, he was like, oh yeah, I could pop in. They so came down and I said, if we could buy Overeem back, would we do it? And he looked at me and he's like, well, you, well, you would, wouldn't you? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, well, we can. And he was like, yeah, oh, yeah, I just remember pretty, it was amazing. That was, a, that was a pretty cool memory. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things, obviously, you know, you guys run it now, but um, I'm assuming he has a slight little say in everything that goes yeah. on or yeah. certain parts of the business. And anyone that knows Casey <laughs> knows he's a pretty meticulous man. And, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and he, he likes done, things done a certain way. So mm. whether or not it's... Um, so he's back tomorrow doing some bottling, I hear. He'll he is, be in yeah. this afternoon yeah. already. Oh, this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, he's just checking on it everything's mm. going but yeah he's involved in it in a good way now like yeah, he doesn't have good. to do all the it's more of a mentorship work role, and now he's mentoring yeah. and yeah. back to being the hobby stuff again yeah. started yeah. off as a being hobby on the tasting panel mm. and did it as a business and now it's back to doing what he actually loves doesn't have to worry about the day-to-day -day trading yep. stuff and yeah, things absolutely. Like that. Yeah. absolutely so we'll wrap it up pretty quickly but like let's give us a talk about what you actually do like what bottles are available where they're available at because sure. obviously you know I'm from Brisbane, unfortunately, not in, we have Dan Murphy's, that's it. We don't have any like independent bottling places or that. Yeah. Where can we yeah, actually right. get over in from? There's not a lot of independent. There's nothing There's up none. in Brisbane. No, we've got Malt Traders, um, Emporium Wines, and that's it. Wow. wow. And that's it. And they have an amazing collection, but they're very yeah. also just very small places. Like that would be the whole whiskey collection. Okay. So yeah. I don't have much places Are to they singular bottle shops or franchises? Uh, no, Malts is, is they're all independents. Okay, yeah. Right. yeah. So yeah. we have BWSs everywhere. We have Dan Murphy's everywhere. Sure, mm. sure. Um, Mer uh, Mermaid Beach and Kiwana are the only two whiskey ones. So for some reason, they're the biggest whiskey ones. Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast. Right. Nothing in the Brisbane. Wow. So it's, mm. it's, I don't understand. And that's where the big ones are. So, where would the people go, especially from Brisbane? Can they buy direct off, offline? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, perfect. So, definitely, if you want to go online and, and buy any overeem, you'll see what's um, available on our website. Um, and if you join the mailing list, you'll get notified of any uh, limited releases that we've got coming up. Yep. Um, but yes, we are in Dan Murphy's, um, but only the precinct stores. Right. Um, so, so that'd be Kiwana or Mermaid Beach in Melbourne. Certain areas, yeah, absolutely. Right. So definitely not all of them. Um, and then, yeah, around the rest of the country, a lot of independent bottle shops. Um, and you can just email us to ask if you want to pick up one from your local. Yep. Um, yeah. So what? out of all the bottles we've got here, so what are we drinking at the moment? Sure, we're drinking the... I knew that was a double-sided question. I was like, what was the other yeah, part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. We're so drinking we got... the forecast mature um, right, okay. expression at 43% ABV. Um, super. It's pretty, like Jane mentioned before, it probably is our flagship, our flagship expression. Thank you. Yep. Um, it's you know super soft, super approachable, delicate. It's just uh, um, you know hints of uh, butterscotch and honeycomb, and caramel. caramel and toffee, right. and uh, su super. Uh, it's it's it really exemplifies um, the the signature of Overeem, yeah. yeah, and uh, that you'll spine throughout our core range. Um, but it's a really good starting point if you want to venture into Overeem single malt whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. absolutely delicious. And the best thing about it, you don't do 500 mil bottles. Mm. I know, yeah. all 700 mils, that's a really yeah. good thing to yeah. know. We won't, so we won't get into that, the whole no, political no. thing at the moment yeah. with what's going on online, but yeah. 700 mil bottles, so you've got you know a lot of it and the value for it is actually really good for the prices. So before we wrap up, um, what is the future for Overeem? Or where would you like it to be? Do you want to be three times the size of this? Do you mm. want to, you know, and have 50 staff members where you're, you know, controlling them all? Or do you want to mm. keep it as it is where you are that, what's, what would, what classify would you classify it as? Uh, what, what did I say? Um, small, small, large guy or small, uh, big guy? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're large enough to be relevant, but small enough to be craft. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, we still want to maintain that sort of model to an extent, like, um, Obviously, we'd like to expand our market reach and get Overeem into as many many people's hands as we can, and get yep. get get as many people as we can enjoying it and appreciating it. Um, but we don't want to. Um, we won't be sacrificing quality to be able to do that. 
good yeah. at it. So um, we, we will always do things by hand and always do things yeah. through sensory evaluation. And, and in, in the way that Casey, using the, the foundation that, uh, or the, the, the principles that Casey founded the distillery on. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things, and we wrap up now, but one of the things that I have absolutely enjoyed from you and you're a little bit surprised about it is that when we were going through the bond storm or going through everything like that, you guys still have that energy, that real love for it and the passion. Now, you don't generally bring people to here. It's not, you don't advertise where you are and like that. You don't do tours and stuff like that. So it's a very special moment for us to be able to come down here yeah. and brought a friend of mine. Um, so we appreciate what you've done, but the, the passion and the love and the, the fun that you guys have in your eyes and your face and like the energy and inviting us in is really warming to know yes. that you're not just doing it to make a bit of money. You're mm. actually doing it, obviously, it's legacy in a way, sure. yeah. but also Absolutely. because you both love it, what you do. So yeah. I just want to say thank you for inviting us through. We've had a few whiskeys today and it's, <laughs> uh, I feel very happy and very good. <laughs> um, it's been a great day. And, yeah. I, and as I said, I just really appreciate you guys inviting us through. So cool. thank you so much for joining us as well. No Thanks worries. for coming. So, thanks, no, thanks, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 Thanks.